China is a huge market, but there are risks going into it and any business going into it has to be aware of those risks. That's exactly right. Actually, that's the title that was assigned to the book by uh, Wiley, our publisher. Uh, my original title, my working title was a little different, and I thought it was um, a pretty good one as well. It was uh, based on a phrase that's used in China by almost everybody at some point in time or another. It, the phrase is one bed, two dreams which, uh, in my opinion, adequately uh, describes why most joint ventures don't work. Actually, anywhere, not just in China. Okay. Can you explain that? One bed, two dreams. One bed, two dreams. Yeah. Well, you know, another way of looking at it is it probably explains the high divorce rate in the U.S. as well, meaning people get together, ah. and uh, but they each have a different vision of what they want to happen, how they want the relationship to evolve, what their goals are. And that's, I think, really true uh, with joint ventures, and especially so in China. Exactly. Yeah, that makes perfect sense now. That, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Okay. And can you tell us how, how did you get involved in, in China? Can you tell us a bit about your journey from, because you're in, you're in business, you're in the financial sector at Silicon Valley Bank. Can you tell us how you ended up getting into the Chinese market, please? Sure, absolutely. So I was with Silicon Valley Bank fundamentally for 30 years. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that our bank doesn't exist anymore um, as of about a year and a half ago because of a huge mistake that was made by the uh, CFO and not corrected by the board, at least not in time. Be that as it may, our business model was a really good one. Uh, take some pride in that because I was, in a sense, the author of the business model. When I became CEO in 2001, at that point in time, our bank worked with technology companies, maybe 30% of our portfolio. We worked with real estate developers, uh, and we worked with small business. And the big decision that I made in 2001 was this. I felt that, um, you know, there, at the, that point in time, there must have been 13, 14,000 banks in the U.S., and all of them worked with real estate developers, and all of them worked with small business. But we were almost the only one in the entire country that worked with technology companies, and in particular with early stage technology companies. So that was where we had a leg up on everybody else. And my feeling was, why compete against 13,000 other banks when you don't have any specific advantage over them? Why not focus on what we do better than um, anybody else? So my first big decision, I only made a couple in 10 years as CEO, was to ask two-thirds of the portfolio to find another bank over time. And then we filled up that empty two-thirds with technology companies. And then the second thing I wanted to do was go global uh, because we were we had pretty well penetrated the U.S. At that point in time, we had by far and away the biggest market share. Going global for us included initially Israel, India, London in particular, but Europe in general. And finally, we set our uh, sight sights on China. I was in China with a group of people from our bank in the year 2000, giving a speech at the uh, first meeting of the Chinese Venture Capital Association. We spent a couple of weeks after the speech touring around, and it was pretty clear to us that there were budding innovation centers in China, that if the trajectory continued would be huge. So we decided we really wanted to be there. And then ultimately, it takes a long time to get started in China. Um, ultimately, we were able to position ourselves in such a way that China was asking us to come and build a technology-oriented bank just like the one that we have here in the U.S. in um, either Shanghai or Beijing. And that was the invitation more or less co coincided with my stop date, meaning already in 2001, when I became CEO, I knew that I was going to retire at the end of 2010. 
that would be 10 years in that position. That's sufficient. I was already of retirement age. We got the signal from Beijing to come to China. And when the board uh, made the decision to accept the invitation and looked around, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, <laughs> they, they couldn't find anybody who wanted to go <laughs> except for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I talked to my wife and she was uh, as excited as could be. She said, that's an adventure you can't miss. So let's go. Gotcha. Okay. And I'd like to explore what you found in China because from your book, I get the sense that you've got to be wary of these invitations, it seems, that they've, they're they strategically trying to find business partners that they can get the IP of, they can uh, you know get some technology or knowledge transfer from. And so you were, it sounds like you're actively targeted. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. That's one of the main points, um, in fact, in my book. Somewhere around um, the beginning of 2009, fully two years before um, I moved to China, I was um, encouraged to get together in a meeting with the person who was then party secretary of Shanghai. His name was Yu Zhengsheng. When Xi Jinping came to power at the end of 2012, Yu Zhengsheng was elevated from party secretary of Shanghai to, a mem to being a member of the standing committee, meaning one of the seven most powerful people in China. I had, I believe, four meetings with Yu Zhengsheng in 2009. And during those meetings, he laid it on heavy. He, this is honestly what he said. Uh, you may think I'm exaggerating, but uh, he said, you know, Ken, you're, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. You really understand China better than almost any Westerner I've ever run into. We've scoured the universe and we found your bank. It's the one that we, where we most admire. He, and then he explicitly said, more than Goldman Sachs, <laughs> more than Morgan Stanley. We have to have you here. We'll pave the way. And of course, I didn't realize that this is all part of the process, meaning that there were probably similar such meetings uh, going on in other places in China, maybe even that same day, mm -hmm. uh, because flattering you um, beyond belief is the first step in the process. And of course, um, I, I'll admit that I was um, more naive than would have been desirable. On the other hand, I wasn't so stupid that I didn't realize he was laying it on too thick. Mm, yeah. But at the same time, you know, it, it felt good. <laughs> and I really wanted to build a bank in China. So we uh, accepted the offer. Okay. And then how did it go? So what was their, your ongoing relationship with the officials and how did they facilitate or hinder the setting up of the bank? How did the actual relationship progress and what did they get out of it? You know, what benefits did you get from the relationship? And yeah, I just want to understand how it evolved and how you came to this view that you express in the book about the, you know, just the, uh, this China business conundrum, please, Ken. Sure. Um, first of all, it was a very long process. Mm. Again, those conversations, as I said before, at the beginning of 2009, um, by 2010, we were in active conversations with the bank that would ultimately be our joint venture partner, a, kind of a shotgun bride, if you will. They were selected for us. Uh, by the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Um, and the way it was described to me at the time was, of course, you realize, Ken, you'll need to have a joint venture partner. But understand, this is for your benefit, not for ours, because China is a risky place and it's so much different from what you're used to. You'll need a joint venture partner. Mm. And of course, that made perfect sense to me. And frankly, the conversations um, over a, about a year and a half period with our would our joint venture partner went swimmingly. It was all very, very nice. And um, once I arrived in China, though, at the beginning of 2011, there were a lot of mixed signals. 
And there was a lot of hurry up and slow down, hurry up and slow down. Mm. And it became um, really quite confusing for me. In retrospect, I believe that I would have benefited by spending a couple of years. Of course, I'd been in China at that point in time, probably at least 20 times uh, by the time I moved. But visiting and living are two different things. And it probably would have been better if I had spent a couple of years in China before we even embarked on this process, understanding China from a political point of view, from a governance point of view, from a from a cultural point of view and from a business climate point of view. And I might not have been so naive. Right. Yeah. You mentioned there's this concept, uh, I'm not going to pronounce it properly. Uh, is it Guanxi? Uh, how do you pronounce that? And could you explain what that is, please? Yeah, Guanxi is probably maybe the most commonly used word in uh, the literature about um, how people do business in China. And all it really means, I think, is um, mutually beneficial relationship. In fact, I've gotten more than one lecture by members of the party on uh, what Guanxi is and the benefits of Guanxi. The concept is, let's say that, uh, Gina, that I want to develop a relationship with you, Mm. and you're interested in developing a relationship with me. Every time I see you, I'll bring you a small gift. And I'll be constantly looking for opportunities to do you favors. And you'll be doing the same thing for me uh, in my direction. And over time, we build a relationship that is allegedly at least based on trust. It's certainly based on mutual obligation because I've given you so many things you owe me and you've given me so many things I owe you. And it, it, in a sense, it's be, it's even more important in today's China. It's an ancient concept, I believe, but it's even more important in today's China because the level of trust in today's China between individuals is really very low as a result, I would say, of the um, way in which the Chinese Communist Party has governed since uh, it came to power in 1949. Mm. Okay, so this uh, Guanxi, uh, this is interesting, and in you're bringing these gifts. Are you bringing gifts to, at times, party officials or officials of state-owned enterprises? Can I, I just want to understand how this, uh, what's the role of the state in, in this? And does that mean that there's some, is it corruption in a way? Uh, can you elaborate on that, please? I just want to understand this whole system and whether there is any corruption involved in it. Sure. No, there's, there's, a, 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 frankly, a huge amount of corruption okay. uh, involved in it. <laughs> By the way, Gene, I don't mean to imply that there's no corruption in uh, the U.S. or in Australia, mm. but corruption takes many forms, and it's uh, often informed by culture. So it's, as I'm going to describe it, I would say it's shared by many other countries, but somewhat unique in China. And yes, I was dealing constantly with government officials because one thing that we don't appreciate, we Westerners and Americans maybe in particular, we may be more naive than most Westerners, we don't appreciate is the extent to which other countries um, have different cultures. I think we operate under the assumption that people are pretty much the same all around the world. And of course, There's an element of truth to that, but it's also true that there are significant differences in culture, governance, and um, uh, the structure of the financial systems that can make a huge, huge difference in uh, the way you conduct business. So certainly one aspect of the party's behavior is to um, shower uh, favors and gifts on people like me, frankly. I, and I think that it's uh, it's somewhat manipulative uh, in the sense that it puts us in a position where we, first of all, feel obligated. And uh, secondly, if we're not careful what kind of gift we accept, we may actually uh, end up feeling compromised, which yeah. is maybe one of the reasons why business people who end up being played. And I would argue that almost all Western business people are played 
in China, um, largely by uh, the government, meaning the uh, Chinese Communist Party. One of the reasons that they don't like to talk about it afterwards is many of them have been compromised to one degree or another. Yeah. I believe. Yes, yeah. Oh, plausible for sure. Uh, and and what sort of gifts are we talking about? Are we talking about bottles of wine? Are we talking holidays? Are we talking Rolex watches? What, what type of gifts are we talking about? All kinds of things. Yeah. But I'll give you three examples. Mm. And these are representative examples. One of them would be my conversation partner at our joint venture partner, the man who was the president of the bank at the time, I think about um, five or six months into our stay after we arrived, he almost sheepishly asked me one day, he said, Ken, is it common in the United States for people to invite uh, the, their business partners to dinner at their house? And I said, yeah, that happens on occasion, for sure. It's I, I actually somewhat rare in China. You don't get invited into houses often. You get invited to restaurants, but seldom into houses. Uh, so he said, well, would you mind inviting me and my wife to dinner at your house? And I said, no, that'd be great. So we set it up. And uh, my wife was shocked. She said, I don't know how to cook Chinese food. We'll have to get a caterer. In any case, he brought a gift with him. In fact, I I have it here somewhere. It's a mythological creature made out of glass. It's about 10 inches long. It's kind of part lion, part dragon. In any case, I thought I'd seen that in a shop sometime in the month or two prior. And I thought, this is a pretty expensive gift. So I checked it out the next morning, and it was, it was worth about um, $800 uh, retail. Well, our board, meaning Silicon Valley Bank's board, the interpretation of the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act precluded me from accepting this gift. Right. So I was in a pickle there. That's one example. Another example would be in uh, Shanghai, there was a, a woman w- who worked in the financial services department of the municipal government of Shanghai who was in charge of what they call the little giants. And these are, the government spends a lot of time studying the market, trying to figure out which startups are likely to be successful, and then nurturing them in one way or another in order to um, enhance the probability that they'll be successful. And uh, she wanted to develop a relationship with me. So she and her husband invited my wife and me on a trip to go to um, Shandong province to uh, Confucius's grave, which is, you know, that's an attraction. People like to go there. So we went, as soon as we got there, we were delivered by this couple into the hands of high level party officials. I really, we ended up not even seeing the couple for three days. Uh, and for three days, high level party officials were were taking care of us. Um, And they wanted to pay for everything. They wanted to pay for the hotel and every dinner. And these were expensive hotels. I refused. And uh, it was interpreted as somewhat of an insult. And a third thing that I'll mention was in my second and third year there, I believe, this is my strong recollection, two times anyway, the head of HR in our joint venture, who was a member of the party, uh, came to me with the good news that the uh, party had uh, decided to give me a bonus. Uh, It was about close to a half a million dollars. And it was meant for me. It wasn't for anybody else. It was meant for me. And it was just for being such a good citizen. So what I did with it, I didn't want to forfeit the opportunity to add a half a million dollars to our equity base in the bank. So I took it and funneled it into the bank, which was contrary to their wishes. They wanted me to keep it for myself. But I also wonder how many um, people actually do that. My Mm -hmm. suspicion is that a number of people stick it in their own bank account. And uh, I'm not saying that it's always the case that they um, feel compromised to the extent that they don't want to talk later about the uh, way in which they've been played. 
but I will guarantee you they've been played, and uh, that most people would not want to would not want to complain about it in public because they would be afraid of potential repercussions. Can we just go back to the the joint venture partner that you had? Was this a was this a private sector a bank? Is it was it another bank? Was it a was it state owned? Was was there a, a involvement of the Chinese Communist Party somehow? Can you just tell us a bit more about the? That the partner? Yeah, I will. Uh, and let me also, at the risk of sounding like I'm picking on your language, uh, which I don't intend to do, but um, I want to mention something else before I answer your question. Yes. And that is, I think one of the reasons that we we have such difficulty, we Westerners, and maybe in particular we Americans, is that we tend to, we have mental models. We've got ideas in our head about the way things work based on our own experience in the U.S. And we take those with us to China, and then we just superimpose them on China, and we begin to interpret what we see through the lens of these mental models. So that was what you happen to accidentally mention one of my favorites, <laughs> the distinction okay. between state-owned and private. Okay. You know, I know American uh, business people who have done a lot of business in China over time, and they still cling to this notion that China has state-owned companies and it has private companies. Well, it does in a sense, but the distinction is not the same as the distinction in the U.S., meaning the Chinese Communist Party controls anything it wants to. And you can be a so-called private company, but they may very well, um, and it's highly likely if you're the least bit successful, own part of you, sometimes clandestinely through shell companies. They um, definitely will have a party committee which can supersede your own personal wishes or the decisions of the board. So you may be a private company, but you, from a, by our U.S. definitions, you're sort of gravitating into being state-owned. Now, back to your question, virtually all banks are primarily state-owned in China. Mm. So, yes, our um, joint venture partner was state-owned, actually owned by the municipality of Shanghai. And uh, because we're, uh, I negotiated 50-50, uh, which is rare. It's uh, usually when you enter into a joint venture with a, a particularly, a clearly, unequivocally state-owned Chinese company, the most you get is about 20%. And I was so proud of myself because we negotiated 50%. I didn't realize at the time that it's irrelevant uh, because in the end, <laughs> the CCP will control you. Mm. <laughs> Whether you own 10% or 50% or 80%. So yes, our joint venture partner was a state-owned company, and by virtue of the of that fact, our joint venture was functionally a state-owned company. Gotcha. And what's the status of it now? Is it is it ongoing? And what, was it impacted by the collapse of SBB? Yes, it was impacted by the collapse of SBB. So I'll tell you this: when we got um, permission to enter into this joint venture, we were. Uh, literally, the first Western bank, I believe, to be given permission to enter into a joint venture with a Chinese commercial bank. I need to stick the word commercial in there because it wouldn't be true of investment banks. Morgan Stanley, years before, had been given permission to do a similar such thing. But we were the first... Um, Western Commercial Bank given permission by the uh, party to enter into a joint venture with a Chinese commercial bank. Our status, meaning that permission and the banking license that went with it, was go as good as gold when we got it. A lot of people would have liked to have had it, and I'm sure we could have sold it for a pretty penny. Having said that, by the time SVB uh, disappeared, which was a year and a half ago, on the one hand, our joint venture bank in China was 
if not flourishing, certainly doing well enough uh, to be desirable. On the other hand, relations between the U.S. government and the Chinese government were at such a low ebb and continue to be that nobody would have liked to have had it. So when SVB was taken over by the regulators in the U.S. in March of 2022, the regulators disassembled the bank in, in all of its parts and put them all on the auction block. And the U.S. commercial banking operation was snatched up almost immediately by a bank from North Carolina called First Citizens. And then other parts of the bank were bid on in the fullness of time. To the best of my knowledge, there is only one part that was never bid on by anybody, and that was our 50 percent ownership in the joint venture in China. and. Uh, as a result, I think that the um, Chinese government, understandably, I can't fault them for this, um, gave up on its being purchased by anybody and simply absorbed it about five or six weeks ago into our joint venture partner. So it, it just disappeared. Right. So the, the bank continues, right, okay, uh, but you, the the SVB stake is, is gone, okay. Um, can I ask what you meant? You talked about control. Uh, by the officials or the the, the Chinese, what, what did control involve? What are some some examples of that? I I'll speak about control in three different ways, um, to give you a better sense. The first thing I want to say, which is arguably the most important, is that when we they granted us the license, meaning we talked about it for two years. Uh, when I moved to China, we began putting the, pe- the parts together. That was at the beginning of 2011. We finally actually got the banking license in, at the end of 2011. So it took almost a year to put it, once I was on the ground, it took almost a year to put it together. And putting it together mean, meant creating a bank from scratch and hiring um people to fill all the positions. So by October of 2011, we had 62 positions filled. I believe there were only two or three uh, Americans, I being one of them. The rest were all Chinese nationals. We finally got that, that license, the banking license. But when we got the banking license, they told us, the government told us, we're so happy. This is a wonderful day. We, you get your banking license today. It's a big success for both of us. However, there's one thing that um, you probably aren't going to like, but not don't worry about it. And that is there's been a, a law on the books now since the end of the Mao era. You know, Mao was from 1949 until um, uh, 1976. He made basically dismantled the banking system. There were no banks in China for all that period. Then Deng Xiaoping came to power late 70s, early 80s, and he ordered the reestablishment of the banking system. So what they told us in October of 2011 is, you know, we're sorry that this is the way it is, but um, there's a law in China that's been around since Deng, and the law says that if there's any new bank and your joint venture bank is a new bank that has any foreign ownership, and your joint venture bank has foreign ownership because 50% of it is owned by SVB and only 50% of it by uh, the Chinese government, that new bank cannot use Chinese currency for the first three years. So that is definitely a form of control to the extent that we really didn't have any business to do for three years. It Mm -hmm. would be like somebody saying to you, we're so happy we're giving you a license to open a restaurant. Mm -hmm. But sadly, um, and we're sorry this is the case, we wish we could undo it, but sadly you're not going to be allowed to use food for the first three years. Uh, Because without Chinese currency, there wasn't much we could do. No. And uh, so that was that is a major form of control, correct? The second thing that I will mention is that 
the uh, situation in China is different from uh, the situation in the U.S. when it comes to banking licenses. If you get a, if the Federal Reserve or the controller of the currency granted you a banking license, you could do anything any other bank could do, starting on day one. And what I found out in November, in October of 2011, is yes, we got this banking license, but all it permits us to do is to call ourselves a bank, um, have a front door, and welcome people to come in. It doesn't allow us to do any banking business per se. Meaning, even if we had been allowed to use um, renminbi, Chinese currency, we couldn't have opened deposit accounts, we couldn't have made loans, we couldn't have exchanged currencies, we couldn't have done anything. Because every single discrete banking activity requires a separate and discrete license. So Mm. to run a bank like ours, which is be true of almost any other bank for that matter, would require 20, 30 licenses. We, by the time we disappeared, we still didn't have all 20 or 30 licenses. Um, so that's another form of control, correct? Yes, yes. The third thing I would say is the Federal Reserve came into existence a little over 100 years ago. I think 115 years ago. And in the last 150 years, let's just say it d- developed, um, let's just say arbitrarily, this is a made up number, but a thousand regulations for banks. If the Federal Reserve has a thousand regulations for banks, the CBRC, which was then the re- regulator in China of banks, has 50,000 mm. regulations. And they've only been in existence since 2000 and either one or two, I forgot which. So in you know, in a, a little over a decade, they developed vastly more regulations than our Federal Reserve was able to develop in over 100 years. And interestingly, we had to report to the Federal Reserve about monthly. We had to report to the CBRC, our joint venture bank in China, had to report to the CBRC daily. It was like running a McDonald's where every night you plug in the information of the day and it it goes immediately uh, to Chicago where it's interpreted and then uh, directions are shot back to you the next morning. And that happens daily in McDonald's. Mm. And that happens daily with, (laughs) with banks in China. So that's a third level of control, which it's utterly mind boggling, isn't it? Yeah, it sounds mind-boggling. It's quite quite extraordinary. I just want to understand uh, what did they end up getting out of it, or like th- this. I get the sense that you think that the SVB got it didn't get the as good a deal as it as it could have, uh, or that there was, you know, the the Chinese took advantage of SVB in a way. What did they end up getting out of it that you think was uh, unfair in a way. Now, let me steer uh, clear of words like unfair. Um, okay. Although I feel that way down deep. <laughs> but yes. I don't want to use that word. I This was, this harkens back to what I said at the beginning about my original title, One Bed, Two Dreams. Yes. Our dream, I can tell you what our dream was very mm. brief. Um, we wanted to be and were until we disappeared. Uh, a year and a half ago, we wanted to be the most important player in fin- the financial services arena uh, uh, with respect to technology companies and, and in particular, early stage uh, venture back technology companies. And we fundamentally achieved that. We had about 60% market share in the US and we had growing market share in innovation centers around the world. And we felt that innovation is a global industry, unlike many other industries. You can have a mining industry that's fundamentally local. You can have a, a farming industry that's fun, agricultural that's fundamentally local. But technology is global, inherently global. If you're cutting edge, you have to be cutting edge everywhere. 
uh, because technology is an abstraction. And as you well know, it travels around the world. No president can build a wall high enough to stop it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, that's the role we wanted to play. Uh, And the other thing, of course, was we were hoping to make money for our shareholders. So that was our dream. What was their dream? Their dream was to understand our business model and how it worked. And that was first and foremost their dream. Uh, They didn't, I don't think they cared one whit how much money they made off us. Uh, I think they simply wanted to understand our business model. I think we were a great disappointment to them because by the end of the first year, I was able to discern that they had been operating under the mistaken perception that we had an algorithm that would enable us to differentiate between early stage technology companies that would ultimately be successful and those who wouldn't. And when I when I, they accused me at the end of the first year of bad faith because I hadn't disclosed the algorithm. Ah. When I explained to them, you know, I'm I'm shocked that you would think that <laughs> we don't have an algorithm. Ours is good old fashioned hard work uh, and pattern recognition. To be a lender in our bank, it takes about ten years. You have to go through an extensive apprenticeship, uh, and that's the way it works. <laughs> There's no algorithm. They were shocked, and in the same way that I was shocked. Uh, so that we were a disappointment to them, I think. And I think that that caused them to become increasingly less interested in our success as time went by. But that's the, the difference. I would do want to explain uh, one more point in time because it's so pertinent to yeah. uh, the experience. And that is that when I found out in October of 2011 that we weren't going to be able to do much business in the next three years anyway, because we wouldn't be able to use um, Chinese currency, I assigned what what few banking activities we were able to engage in to other people. And I spent three years trying to find a path to Xi Jinping because Ultimately, in a a society as authoritarian as uh, the PRC, big decisions emanate from the top all the way down. And if anybody was going to give us an exception to allow us to begin using renminbi, um, it would have to come from the likes of Xi Jinping. So I uh, sat down with myself and charted several paths from my humble station up to the top and worked those paths for three years. And I made some progress. There's evidence that I made progress and that my plight and my story was uh, known by uh, people at the very top of China by the end of the three-year period. However, I did not succeed in getting the exception. But here's what did happen. After three years, the um, government slash party came to me again, and they said, this is such a happy day. Everything's a happy day. Uh, It's such a happy day (laughs) because this is the day we can grant you permission to use renminbi. So it's what we've all been working toward. And then they said, by the way, there is one other request. We admire your business model so much that we want, we're starting next week, a a brand new bank here in Shanghai, and we're going to use your business model. And uh, would you mind spending some time with the management team of this new bank, helping them to understand some of the things that they were not able to understand by watching you fundamentally doing nothing in the last three years? Yeah. So that's how it played out. And you had and to by, try, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, let, let me just say one other thing, and that is when we got the license in October of 2011, they said to me, um, it, it's sad that we can't let you use RMB, but you can do what we would do. Meaning, here in China, we all help each other because we're trying to succeed as a country. 
And you can teach your business model to um, Chinese banks in the next three years. That would be a good use of your time. And uh, we will, we know that you've got a, 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 a heavy burden with these 62 employees. Uh, we don't want you to lose too much money. So we'll give you subsidy for the next three years. Not enough to be profitable, but enough mm. to not lose as much as you might otherwise. And uh, they were constantly in the for the three year period asking me to send uh, groups to different banks in China to teach them how to how our business model works so that they could begin to emulate it as quickly as is possible. And uh, frankly, I wasn't willing to do that. And that would be what I call in my book the Green Hat Award. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there's a, a belief, a common belief uh, in China that you men shouldn't wear green hats because if you wear a green hat, it indicates to others that you're being, uh, uh, your wife is cheating on you. <laughs> yeah. And I felt I should be wearing a green hat because. <laughs> I I'd gotten the, our board support in building this new bank in China, and it was really so that I could teach my competitors <laughs> the our business model. <laughs> which I hope you see the connection. If you don't, just uh, ignore it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's extraordinary. So they're wanting to wanting you to teach competitors of of the bank. It's just bizarre. Honestly, face your board and say, yeah. you know, I was successful. I taught a whole bunch of competitors how to use our business model. And uh, so I want to underscore one thing you haven't asked, but um, I'll answer it anyway. And the one thing I want to underscore was it didn't work, but I really valued the four years in mm. China. It was, it was exhilarating. It was fascinating. It was the most interesting four years of my life. My wife would say the same thing. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I do believe that the Chinese Communist Party is, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most problematic business partner, joint venture partner that you could imagine. Yeah. Uh, so it was a very mixed experience. Yeah, I can, I can understand. Uh, I've had a guest... From Arizona State University on the show before Alan Professor Alan Morrison there, and he's written a book Enterprise China, and he you know we talked a bit about the specifics of it and the involvement of the party and in, in businesses across China, and yeah, similar similar theme to to your book. Uh, I, I know you call it something different, don't you? Call it is it China Inc? You call the model China Inc is the phrase that I use because. Think about it this way, and I'm sure it sounds exactly like what your uh, other acquaintance in Arizona uh, is pointing to. Think about it this way. If Cisco goes to China, it's hardly likely that any other uh, American technology company is going to assist Cisco in its uh, attempt to compete in China. And the U.S. government is unlikely to assist Cisco in its attempt to compete in China. I just pick Cisco arbitrarily. But uh, Chinese banks sometimes help each other. And the Chinese government definitely steps into the fray mm. and through its, its many levers uh, helps Chinese companies succeed. When we were, when I was at the absolute low point thinking this is never going to work, I, I had been, by the way, by way of background, I'd been on the board of the San Francisco Fed for seven years, uh, starting somewhere around 2005. I was on that board. And even after I went to China, I went back once a month for a day to attend those uh, uh, Federal Reserve board meetings. So when I was at a low point in China, sort of midway through the four-year period, I went um, during one of my uh, monthly visits to the Fed, I took the opportunity to talk to 
the people in charge. And I said, well, I don't understand why in 2011, I believe it was, you granted three Chinese banks licenses to operate in the U.S. And they're allowed to use American currency. Why on earth aren't we aren't we mm. reciprocating? <laughs> in other words, for tap. And you know what their response was? Yeah. That's not our job. You chose to go on your own. We didn't send you. <laughs> and our job is to ensure the safety and soundness of the American banking system. It's not to help you succeed in China. Mm. Or it's not to um, discriminate against Chinese banks in order to uh, balance the equation. Um, and that would say that in a mean spirited way. It's just their yeah. view. So it is different. Mm, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. And, and yeah, it was good to explore your experience. Uh I mean, I could probably talk to you for another hour, but I'm going to have to. I'll have to wrap it up because you've got you've got things to do, and uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been amazing. I think there's that bigger conversation about you know, policy toward China, and there's that whole notion of decoupling and all that. And uh, and now there's, I mean, there's very you know there's the debate about uh, trade policy toward China, but that's you know that's another an issue for another another day i suppose uh is there anything else uh you'd like to mention before we wrap up please ken no i think i've pretty much said it all i <laughs> i very much appreciate the opportunity uh we are in somewhat of a pickle here uh in the u.s and for that matter in australia <laughs> because we are notwithstanding the disengagement that we um, believe we're executing right now, we are inextricably tied up with China. And uh, undoing those those ties is, is not an easy thing. It's an extremely complicated thing. Exactly. 欢迎来到六度解析, 在今日华尔街频道的六度解析中更重要的是将它们串联起来。我将分析多方视角，揭示隐藏的脉络，为你提供单一媒体常常忽略的背景信息。无论是政治、经济，还是全球事务，我都将为你带来最具洞察力的分析。试想一下，拥有洞悉全